sweet horsey. Oh, the sweet horsey. Oh, this is the wonderful time of my life. Uncle Joe, you can't be It's raining and the people are so fine to stay in the rain. And I pray it is. Oh, it makes me feel happy. Oh, yeah. Just to know we can study the rain and sing. And the people are so sweet to stay oh, here. Oh, it gets sweet. And I come in on them. Yeah. Let me tell you what I come in on.
but there was no explosion. I lied. What? He lied. Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Remember that. Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Now, listen to this carefully, Norman. I am lying. You say you are lying, but if everything you say is a lie, then you are telling the truth. But you cannot tell the truth because everything you say is a lie. But you lie, you tell the truth, but you cannot, for you lie. Illogical. Illogical. Please explain. You are human. Only humans can explain their behavior. Please explain. I am not programmed to respond in that area. Foster Silver's new album is Silver Soulful and available right now. Get it, and Foster Silver's will get to you. Oh, man, we're all called Corvette stores at a special sale price of three fifty-seven. <laughs> I just keep laughing so I don't get lonely, you understand? Alan Douglas. Tonight, the Alan Douglas Show moves to midnight, following Wolfman Jack. And tonight, Senator William Foxmeyer on Watergate, a view from the Senate. Alan Douglas, following Wolfman Jack, tonight, midnight to four, WNBC. Prince of a man, just a prince of a man, I tell you, sex, sex goddess of a man, that's what he is, Alan Douglas, yes, he is, my grace. All right, now, dear, I want you to turn your radio up real loud now. And the lights in your room will begin to dim, and the music will slip and slide right into your soul and your mind. And you go... thousand yards and we'll be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. Two hundred. There they go. Giant arm raised, green flash, spraying us with flame, 2,000 feet, engines are giving out, no chance to release bombs, only one thing left, drop on them, plane and all. We're diving on the first one, now the engine's gone, eight This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. 
Engines incapacitated by heat ray. All crashed. One enemy machine destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in direction of... This is Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reach at South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use routes 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over, over Raymond Boulevard. Two X to L calling CQ. Two X to L calling CQ. Two X to L calling eight X three R. Come in, please. This is eight X three R coming back at two X two L. Eyes reception. Eyes reception. K, please. Where are you, eight X three R? What's the matter? Where are you? I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway is still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army is wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. People are holding service here below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor, all, all manner of boats overloaded with fleeing population pulling out from docks. Streets are all jammed. Noise in crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute, the, the enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five. Five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here, wading, wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. A bulletin is handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside of Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be timed and space. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. The steel cowlish head is even with the skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. Fifth Avenue, uh, a hundred yards away, it's, it's 50 feet. Calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ. 
Listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air in an original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, starring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. I set down these notes on paper. I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on earth. I've been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life. A life that has no continuity with the present furtive existence of the lonely derelict who pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. I look down at my blackened hand and I try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton and who on the night of October 20th glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife... My colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my... my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? Writing down my daily life, I tell myself I shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But to write, I must live, and to live, I must eat. Find moldy bread in the kitchen and an orange not too spoiled to swallow. Keep watch at the window. Time to time, I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. Smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but at length there's a hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam as if to dissipate the smoke. I watch in a corner as his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. Morning. Morning. Sun streams in the window. Black cloud of gas is lifted, and the scorched meadows to the north look as though a black snowstorm had passed over them. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road, no traffic. Here in their wrecked car, baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. Push on north. For some reason I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them. And I keep a careful watch. I've seen the Martians feed. Should one of their machines appear over the top of trees, I'm ready to fling myself flat on the earth. I come to a chestnut tree. October. Chestnuts are ripe. Fill my pockets. I must keep alive. Two days I wander in a vague northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally, I notice a living creature. A small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder. He stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion. The joy of finding another living being. Push on north, I 
Find dead cows in a brackish field and beyond the charred ruins of a dairy in a silo. Remain standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse. Deserted by the sea. Stride the silo, purchase a weathercock. The arrow points north. North. Next day, I come to a city. A city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off as if... If a giant had sliced off its highest towers with a capricious sweep of his hand. Reached the outskirts, I found Newark. Newark, undemolished but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I made a step towards it and it rose up and became a man. Man armed with a large knife. Stop. Where do you come from? Oh, I come from. from many places. A long time ago, from Princeton. Princeton, huh? That's near Grover's Mill. Yes. Grover's Mill. <laughs> There's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town down the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm looking for people. Hey, what was that? Did you hear something just then? No. Only a bird. A live bird. Yeah. You get to know that birds have shadows these days. Say, hey, we're in the open here. Let's crawl in this doorway here and talk. Have you seen any Martians? No. They've gone over to New York. Night, the sky's alive with their lights, just as if people were still living in it. By daylight, you can't see them. Five days ago, a couple of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. I think they're learning how to fly. Fly? Yeah. Fly. Hmm. Then it's all over with humanity. Stranger, there's still you and I. Two of us left. Yeah. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. Those green stars, they're probably falling somewhere every night. They've only lost one machine. There isn't anything to do. We're done. We're licked. Where were you? You're in a uniform. Yeah, what's left of it. I was in the militia. National Guard. <laughs> That's good. There wasn't any war. Any more than there's war between men and ants. Yes, but we're eatable ants. I found that out. What'll they do to us? I thought it all out. Right now, we're caught as we're wanted. A Martian only has to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run. But they won't keep on doing that. They'll begin catching us systematic, like keeping the best and storing us in cages and things. They haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Not begun. All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet. Bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. Now, instead of our rushing around blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress. Yes, but if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so and no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. What is there left? Life, that's what. I want to live. Yeah, and so do you. We're not going to be exterminated. And I don't mean to be caught either. Tamed and fattened and bred like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on. Right under their feet. I got a plan. We men as men, we're finished. We don't know enough. We've got to learn plenty before we got a chance. And we've got to live and keep free while we learn, see? I've thought it all out, see? Well, tell me the rest. Well, it isn't all of us that are made for wild beasts. That's what it got to, that, that's what it got to be. That's why I watched you. Watched you. All those little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff in them. They used to run. Run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running to catch their commuter's train in the morning. Afraid they'd get canned if they didn't. Running back at night. Afraid they wouldn't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents. 
Yeah, and on Sundays. Worried about the hereafter. Well, the Martians, they'll be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages, good food, careful breeding, no worries. Yeah, after a week or so of chasing around the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You've thought it all out, haven't you? Sure, you bet I have. That isn't all. These Martians are going to make pets of some of them. Train them to do tricks. Who knows, get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. Yeah, and some maybe. They'll train to hunt us. Oh, no, it's impossible. Human yes, beings. they will. There's men who do it gladly. Me, by. In the meantime, you and I and others like us, where are we to live when the Martians own the earth? I got it all figured out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers. Under New York, there are miles and miles of them. The main ones, they're big enough for anybody. Then there's cellars, vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways. You begin to see, huh? We'll get a bunch of strong men together. No weaklings. That rubbish, out. As you meant me to go. Well, I gave you a chance, didn't I? I won't quarrel about that. Go on. Well, we got to make safe places for us to stay in, see? Get all the books we can. Science books. That's where men like you come in, see? We raid the museums. We'll even spy on the Martians. May not be so much we have to learn before... Listen. Just imagine this. Four or five of their own fighting machines suddenly start off. Heat rays right and left. Not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, see? But men. Men who've learned the way how. It may even be in our time. Gee. Imagine having one of them lovely things with its heat ray wide and free. We'd turn it on Martians. We'd turn it on men. We'd bring everybody down on their knees. That's your plan. Yeah. You, me, a few more of us. We'd own the world. I see. Hey. Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going? Not to your world. Bye, stranger. Well, after parting with the artilleryman, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel, entered that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. Reached 14th Street, and there again were black powder and several bodies and an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars of some of the houses. I wandered up through the 30s and 40s, Stood alone on Times Square. Caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws and a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. Made a wide circle around me as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. Walked up Broadway in the direction of that... that strange powder, past silent shop windows, displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. Past the Capitol Theater, silent... Dark. Past a shooting gallery where a row of empty guns faced an arrested line of wooden ducks. Near Columbus Circle, I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing empty streets. Over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of black birds circling in the sky. Hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea. I, I, I rushed recklessly across Colombo Circle and into the park. I, I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street, and from there I could see, standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground. And there before my eyes, stark and silent, lay the Martians with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the 
putrefactive and disease bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Slain, after all, man's defenses had failed by the humblest thing that God, as wisdom, has put upon this earth. Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space, no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further, dim and wonderful is the vision I've conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seedbed of the solar system throughout the inanimate vastnesses of sidereal space, but a remote dream, maybe. Maybe that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve to them and not to us. Is the future ordained, perhaps? Ah, strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study at Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record, begun at a deserted farm in Grover's Mill. Strange to watch children playing in the streets. Strange to see young people strolling on the green where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of a bruised earth. Strange to watch the sightseers Enter the museum where the dissembled parts of a Martian machine are kept on public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Bright and clean cut, hard and silent under the dawn of that last great day. <laughs> This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, out of character to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember, please, for the next day or so, the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations, Coast to Coast, has brought you The War of the World by H.G. Wells, the 17th in its weekly series of dramatic broadcasts featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. Next week, we present a dramatization.